And this actually leads us to, to the next topic, which is in-domain versus out-of-domain. What we would like, in general, is out-of-domain generalization. What we have, usually, is in-domain generalization. What does it mean? Let's have a look. We've trained our model on question answering data sets. Now we are experimenting with like real life where question answering is different, like the domain is different, the language people use is not Wikipedia language. And we see there is a strong performance drop because our model is not really capable of out of domain generalization. Here is another nice example on this paper by uh, Thomas McCoy and um, um, we show that actually if you train BERT and it has good performances on like your fine tuning data set like glue, okay, you can then exp you can then test it on another data set which is um, out of the main. So how they did out of the main is here is by having some heuristics. So for instance, you try to make like for instance lexical overlap heuristics. So um, in uh, MNLI, you have two examples, uh, you have two sentences, and you have to say if one entail the other or contradict the other, okay? There are very simple heuristics for that in the data set, which means that usually if there is a not, means contradiction. If there is a lot of lexical overlap, it means usually entailment. So they build an adversarial um, data set called the Hans, which is in the Transformers library, actually. You can use it, we have an example in it. And which is adversarial. So when there is a lot in this data set, in Hans, when there is a lot of lexical overlap, it's contradiction. The good label is contradiction. Here is an example here. And what they show that is that um, they can train several birds on this, fine tune it with ra different random seed. Okay, so the difference is, is very small. The difference between this model is very small. It's just the weight initialization of the last layer. And this model, they behave the similarly on MNLI. Um, they have like very, very similar performances. But when you test them on the adversarial Hans dataset, they behave really differently. Okay, they have this huge variability. Some of them are pretty good. Well, none of them is really, really great, but some of them are not so bad and some of them are really bad. And this means that actually what you see in domain, the test performances you see, just give you no indication of how your model will behave in the real world, which is kind of bad, okay? Here's more example on what they do on MNLI. There are various heuristics they use to design, and you can see you have more or less variability in the fine-tuned model. Some heuristics leads to like really a huge variance, which means that you can't really know how your model will behave in the real world unless you be able unless you were able to test it on real world data. And some are like small, have a smaller effect. Okay. Now, it's really hard to investigate out of the generalization. So one way is to do this kind of heuristics. Another way is try to build our data sets ourselves so we can control them. Um, so the only really uh, interesting field I've seen this work is the work on compositionality. Uh, compositionality is to investigate how your model is actually able to combine the various parts of a sentence to build a meaning representation. This is very important because we think that in linguistics, compositionality is something important that we do. When I say the blue dog is going out, you, you kind of gather blue and dog together in a single, in a single uh, meaning. And then you combine this with the rest of the sentence to build up the meaning. So there's nice work called SCAN and uh, PCFG sets, which was actually a, a really, really uh, long but super interesting paper by Jufke Upkes from um, Amsterdam University. And they kind of build a huge data set uh, that replicates some natural language data sets. So they build this data set in which you, you have to combine instruction together to generate an output. Okay, and you have to combine the instruction compositionally. So you can generate the nice output. So you have like instruction like repeat something and the something will have to be uh, considered as a, as a single entity and then the repeat uh, function at be applied on it. And they were able to naturalize the data set. So they were able to reproduce the depth and the length of like a translation or a very big translation data set, the VMT challenge, okay? So they have this artificial data set. You generate this uh, instruction yourself, but re which really replicates well natural language. And when you have this artificial data set, you can actually do 
some out of domain generalization. So for instance, in your training part, you can remove some instructions, some words, the, the, the model will never see them, or like some um, way to combine words, and then you can investigate how the model will learn to do that. And then like one of the most fascinating experiments I saw last year, which is called the overall generalization. Overall generalization is like super fascinating. It's, it's a bit like when you're when you're a kid, you're learning language and you make mistakes, but these mistakes are like smart mistakes, okay? For instance, you will add ed at the end of a past uh, verb, a verb in the past tense, uh, but it's like an irregular verb. We say, uh, instead of saying I went, we say I go with, okay? <clears throat> and this is called smart mistake because it means you've learned the rule. You've just not learned yet the exception. And we really want our model to learn rules so they can generalize outside of the training domain, okay? So you can investigate that by putting some irregular verbs in this artificial data set. So here you can investigate that. And the nice thing about this paper is that they compared, they compared various architecture. They compared LSTM, they compared ConvNet, they compared Transformer together. And what they see is the really varying performances. Like LSTM, they kind of struggle with this question of over of over generalization and transformer are really a lot better usually and covnet are somewhere in the middle so this is this nice uh, graph where you see on the top you have like a very few uh, examples like a very few exception so it's kind of hard for the model to learn that so here you see during the training the red means that the model is over generalizing the blue means that the model has learned the exception and the gray means that the model actually don't really know what to do. So it's predicting like random output, which is neither the rule, neither the, the, the exception. And when you have only a very few sample, like very ex few exceptions, the model just can't really get them. Confnet managed a little bit to do that, but Transformer and LSTM, they don't. When you have a lot of exceptions, the model learns just to memorize them. That's what we see in your network, okay? They are very good at memorizing, brute force memorization. And when you're in the middle, you see a bit something that's similar to the way human learn, which is that you start to have overgeneralization during the training, you have a peak when you actually overgeneralize everywhere, and then you learn that there are some exceptions. So it's very interesting, and it shows that these models are capable of some out-of-domain generalization somehow. Now, talking about in-domain and out-of-domain generalization, pose the question of how do you measure the distance between your two domains? And that's a very open question. There is a large body of work on domain adaptation that has tried to show that you can actually extract some feature from your data set, and you can compute some similarity metrics on them but it's definitely a very open question. How can you measure the distance, like in a statistical meaning, how you can measure the distance between two datasets, okay? And how you can know when you're not in domain anymore.